Lord for this opportunity to stand before all of you, especially I thank the leadership team for allowing me to come and speak before you all. I truly stand humbly before you, especially before great ministers of God. Um, really, I'm humbled. It is such a blessing that we have committed 21 days of fasting and prayer. And this past week, we've had some amazing word, if some of you didn't get to hear due to work and other situations. I'm just going to briefly summarize uh, every day's word. I hope I do justice to the people who spoke. Uh, so this past week, we heard about evaluating yourself or ourselves and our faith and finding joy in our salvation. We heard the next day, searching our hearts evaluating where we are with the Lord. Next day, we heard about willingness to serve others and how God has called us to serve. The next day, we heard reasons of why Christians fail in their life in comparison to the Philistines and how the Israelites were victorious in comparison to how we can be victorious in our Christian life. And yesterday... Um, we heard that suffering is part of Christian life, and Jesus set an example of how suffering is for us. So for our meditation today, if I can get the PowerPoint up, uh, let's open to Leviticus chapter 26, verse 2. So this same verse in Leviticus chapter 26, verse 2, we see in Leviticus 19.30, okay? But I'm going to focus on Leviticus 26. And reading, observe my Sabbaths and have reverence for my sanctuary, I am the Lord. We will be focusing on the latter part where it says, reverence for my sanctuary. Today in society, we see a total disregard for God, a disrespect for God, which is totally heartbreaking for us. Everyone feels like, not everyone, but a lot of people in society feel like they have the right to speak their opinion. Uh, my opinion matters, and I have the right to express that, regardless of the situation or what other people think, right? And we kind of have a society where we don't have to think before we speak anymore. We just speak, right? And... Uh, this type of process is unfortunately seeping into the church. This casual, my opinion matters, uh, total disregard. I'm not saying in this church, I'm saying the church at large. We have a, a casual way of how we approach God. Um, and so I just want to focus on that latter part where it says reverence for my sanctuary. But, but before we get started, there is the end of that verse. What does it say? I am the Lord. And do you know, I didn't count this, but I looked it up. Thank goodness for Google. I looked it up and it says, an average about 40 to 45 times in the book of Leviticus, it says, I am the Lord, or I am the Lord, your God. And I'm thinking to myself, wouldn't like one time or two times be sufficient in the Lord saying, I am the Lord? We get the point, right? Like just in the book of Leviticus, I'm not talking the entire Bible. I'm just saying in the book of Leviticus itself, it says, I am the Lord over 40, 45 times. Why is God repeating himself? First of all, we don't ever remember these things, and God has to repeat itself. History shows that, right? And parents, as parents, we tell our kids the same thing over and over, and it seems amnesia sets forth. And so I think it's just human nature. We forget, and the Lord is good about reminding right? And the Lord reveals his character as Yahweh the Lord. That's why he's saying it. He's saying, I am Yahweh the Lord. And because I am Yahweh the Lord, the words I'm going to say to you has authority. It's giving authority behind his words, right? And how do we know that? If we look to the Exodus chapter 3 verse 15, what does that say? Exodus 3.15, it says, God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent you. This is my name forever. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me. 
from generation to generation. What? I am the Lord. Why? Because there's a covenant behind that name with Abraham to his chosen people, Israel. That's when he says 45 times in the book of Leviticus, do you know my covenant? Do you remember my covenant with the people of Israel? He's what, that's what he's reminding them, that they have a covenant relationship with the almighty God, that he is theirs and they are his. They belong to each other. And that's why he is saying, I am the Lord, your God. Amen. Getting back to our portion, I was sidetracked a bit. The context of Leviticus 26, the first 13 verses, is talking about the blessing of those who obey or are reverent to God's word. Okay? The latter part, 14 onwards, is talking about the curses that occur to those who are irreverent or disobedient to the Almighty. So let's keep going, right? Leviticus 26.2, it says, reverence for my sanctuary. Let's break it down. What does sanctuary mean? Or let's talk about reverence first. What does reverence mean? Throw me some words. Respect, yes. Honor, yes. Fear, yes. Excellent, excellent. Next slide, it talks about what is the reverence meaning. And so I'm going to say this word because it says reverence for my sanctuary, right? So what is it saying? Admiration for my sanctuary. Be awe of my sanctuary. Devotion for my sanctuary. Honor for my sanctuary. Loyalty for my sanctuary. Gratitude and submitting to one who is superior who is? Lord, right? For my sanctuary. What does sanctuary mean? It's a separated, consecrated place of worship. Or we can say wherever God dwells is sanctuary. So the first reference of sanctuary we're going to read is in Exodus chapter 15, verse 17. And this is a reference to when Moses and Miriam were singing the song. The, the people of Israel had crossed the Red Sea, and now they're worshiping, they're praising, and they're singing the song, and it says, you will bring them in and plant them on the mountain of your inheritance, the place, Lord, you made for your dwelling, the sanctuary, Lord, your hands is established. Who brought them out? God brought them out, right? Who established the sanctuary? Who? God. And how did God establish? It says right there. With his hands. He himself with his hands established the sanctuary. More the reason we need to be reverent, right? The whole point is the almighty God made a covenant relationship with Abraham and Abraham's descendants, the Israelites, the chosen people. And God decides that he wants to dwell in the midst of his chosen people. God Almighty from heaven. Like he doesn't have anywhere to be, right? He's got angels, myriads and myriads of angels. Beautiful place, heaven. Why does he need to come and abide or dwell with his chosen people? That's his heart's desire, right? So let me kind of step back a little. So when we're reading about the tabernacle, we see some things that are specific, right? The color of the curtain, the size and dimensions of the Ark of the Covenant, the size and dimensions of the tabernacle. Have you ever thought, like, does God have nothing better to do than sit and decide the specific color of a curtain? Why does that matter? Why does it matter? Why does those details matter to God? Right? I thought about it many times. God, why couldn't you just say, make a tent, and if you sanctify yourself, I'll come and dwell with you. Isn't that enough? Why all this extra? Because God is in the details. Next slide. God is in the details. God cares about the details. Okay? So when, when God tells us to do things, and we haphazardly do things, that's offensive to God. He does care about the details. He cares who you are, how we behave, how we walk, what we do, all that details, it matters. 
It really does matter to God. Why? I thought that. Remember I just told you earlier that I thought, why does it matter, this details? Because he has the big picture and we don't. Have you ever made like a thousand piece puzzles? Has anybody done those puzzles? And have you ever had like a few pieces you're like, I don't know where it belongs, but I'm going to squash it in there? And then you look at the big puzzle picture and you're like, okay, I get it. That piece wasn't supposed to be there because it just doesn't look right because the details matter. Where you put those puzzle pieces matter. And we in our little limited mind doesn't understand the big picture of God right? We, the people during the Old Testament didn't know that this is just a shadow of what's to happen in the New Testament, right? They didn't understand that God is in the details and it matters. So people of God, when we say, no, God doesn't really care and we can just come as we are and however we are, it doesn't matter. No, it does matter. It does matter. Our details matter because he's a detailed God. Let's read further. Okay, Leviticus chapter 26, verse 11 to 13. Next slide. Um, it says, I will put my dwelling place among you, and I will not abhor you. What does abhor mean? I will not hate you. I will walk among you and be your God, and you will be my people. I am the Lord your God. Here we see it again, right? Who brought you out of Egypt so that you would no longer be slaves to the Egyptians. I broke the bars of your yoke and enabled you to walk with your heads held high. Wow. What happens when you're reverent to the word of God? What happens when you're obedient to the word of God? What does it say? Your yokes are broken. You're free from slavery, right? You're walking with what? Your head's held high. Why? Why? Not because of us, because God Almighty dwells within us. That's what happens when we're reverent to God. Okay, so what happens when we're irreverent to God? Right? These verses literally shook me to pieces. Okay? It means that the Lord no longer wants to dwell with us when we are irreverent or disrespectful to God. That's huge, okay? What does it say, though? Leviticus 26, 17. I will set my face against you. Those who are irreverent or disobedience, disobedient to the decrees and the laws of God, what does it say? What does it say? I will set my face against you. So that you will be defeated by your enemies, and those who hate you will rule over you, and you will flee even though no one is pursuing you. Okay, if no one's pursuing you or fleeing, okay, it's affecting you physically and mentally, right? Right? What happens? The Lord sets his face against us. What do we pray every Sunday? What do we pray every Sunday? Lord, let your face shine upon us. Turn your face toward us. Will that happen if we're irreverent to his decrees and laws and commands of God? Absolutely not. He says, I will set his face against us, my people of God. We need to wake up. Here we see what happens, and our prayer should be, Lord, if there's anything, and that's my prayer, Okay? So when I'm saying I have been ministered to by God, am I irreverent? He's already questioned me. Okay? So I'm saying what I've been spoken to about. Um, if there's anything that I'm doing that's irreverent, disrespectful to your sanctuary, Lord, forgive me and I repent. And that's what we need to be. So here's the next verse. It's pretty hard to swallow. Okay, Leviticus 26, verse 27 to 28. If in spite of this, the fact that God's face is against us, and there's a whole lot of other verses. If in spite of this, you still do not listen, but continue to be hostile toward me, who's hostile? We are hostile towards God. Who started it? We did. We caused the issue here, right? Then in my anger, I will be hostile towards you, and I myself will punish you for the sins seven times over. And if you read that whole chapter, it's seven times, seven times, seven. There's so many seven times that occurs, and it's pretty scary. 
when the omnipotent, all-powerful God is hostile towards his creation, I don't know about you, but we got to be pretty scared. Because can anybody rescue us when God Almighty is hostile against us? Not a soul. Not a soul can rescue us when God Almighty is hostile against us. Only God can rescue us. Paul defines hostility we see in Colossians 1.21. What is a hostile mind? You're probably thinking, well, how do, you, how do I become hostile with God? What am I going to physically fight God? Like, how does this occur? He defines it. He says, I'm reading the ESV because I like the way it's said. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind. I don't read ESV all other times except this one particular verse, by the way. <laughs> And you who once were alienated and hostile in your mind doing evil deeds. What causes us to be hostile in our mind? When we're doing in our sinful ways. Okay? When we were stuck in our old ways of sinful nature, that was hostility towards God. But we're saved now, right? And therefore, we're not hostile towards God anymore. I hope we don't go backwards. Right? So... Um, when we are hostile, then the Lord can no longer dwell with us. But you know what? Even after all this, you, the Lord, we are bitter. I mean, we have made God set his face against us. We have angered God. He is now hostile against us. And you think, that's it. We're doomed, all done. What to do now? We're stuck. I'm just going to dig a hole and just sit in there. No! There's redemption, my people. There's redemption, people of God. Leviticus chapter 26, verse 40. What does it say? I'm not going to read all that. This is a long portion. But basically it says, If we confess our sins and the Father sins and confess our hostility, humble ourselves, then he remembers his covenant to the people of God. People of God, we just have to do that. There's redemption. So if we have been irreverent, if we have been disrespectful, because all of us have at one time or another, if we have this, it's not like there's no hope. God has created created a redemption. He is such a long-suffering God. Even though we don't deserve it, he just says, confess, humble, and he will remember. Not huge, complex things. That's all. Confess and humble ourselves before the Almighty God. Right? All right. So let's talk about an example, which we know, and I'm not going to read it. 1 Samuel chapter 2 talks about Hophni and Phinehas. We all know the story, right? Eli's two sons. And they were, uh, well, let me read verse 12. It says, Eli's sons... Hophni and Phinehas, were scoundrels, it says. What does that say? Worthless men. Okay. Worthless men, scoundrels. They had no regard to God. And I like what they said. They did not know the Lord. Okay, now let's go back. Who's Hophni and Phinehas? And who was Eli? Okay. And what do priests do all day long? What? Talk about God. They're in the sanctuary. They're worshiping God. They're making sacrifices. Okay, so I'm confused. How is this two guys not know the Lord? They don't know the Lord. They're doing all the things, right? They're making the sacrifices. They're in the sanctuary every day, all day long. Like you couldn't be, no one could be more than them in the sanctuary. We're nowhere near that. They're living the priestly life. Yet the Lord says they did not know the Lord. Many times we'll go through the ritualistic worship, we'll go through all the process, we'll do the sacrifices, we'll take Lord's Supper, yet we may not know the Lord. And this is me looking at myself. Have I done that where my heart is not cleansed? I'm going through all the ritualistic part of it, but my heart is not right with the Lord. I, I, don't, I know intellectually about God, but I don't know God. I haven't tasted and seen that the Lord is good. I don't know God. And, that, and the Lord calls that these are worthless men. <laughs> They're worthless. They're scoundrels is what it says, right? So how did Eli's son, Hophni and Phinehas, 
were irreverent or defile the sanctuary of God. I just kind of briefly summarized it. I think I put it on the next slide. First, they were very prideful, right? Like, I'm the priest's son. Do you know who I am? Right? I can take the fatty portion of the meat before even the Lord gets it. Like, they were just claiming all kinds of stuff, right? They were rejecting the decrees and laws of God. They were violating God's covenant. And so what, what, did ha what happened? Because they were disobedient or irreverent to God. They defiled God's sanctuary. And what happened to them? They died. And do you know what happened to the Ark of the Covenant? It got captured. God's dwelling place left the people of Israel. Phineas, Hophnius, and Phineas, two guys. God's dwelling place left. The Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines. The Old Testament, later we know about the temple of God, right? And those are places where God dwelled among his people. We know about the sacrifices, right? And we know about the high priest, once a year, went where and made atonement for the people? Holy of Holies, right? The high priest went to the Holy of Holies once a year. So 364 days, there was no going to the Holy of Holies, only once a year this high priest, and what did he have to do? They had a rope on him, right? Why? So first he had to make the sacrifice and make sure that his sins were cleared, and then he goes in to make for the people's sins, and then only can he go past the veil and go to the, where the Ark of the Covenant is. And I'm telling you, he probably was scared because if he was irreverent, and disrespectful in entering the most holy of holies, what would happen to him? He would die. And nobody could go get him. They'd have to pull him out with the rope. Right? Boy, am I saying, trying to scare all of us, like, if you're irreverent, you're going to die. That's not what my message is. Okay? My message is not to scare us, but to be more aware of who we worship and ensure we worship him in reverence. That's all. Because there's redemption for us if we are irreverent. That's what we read, right? Even after all that Leviticus 2640, that there is still redemption if we confess. In the New Testament, we see in Hebrews 9, verse 11 to 12, I'm not reading that. The Old Testament sanctuary is a shadow. Remember I said God is in the details, right? It matters. Jesus, the high priest, did not go with the blood of animals for making the atonement like the old high priest did. He went with his own blood straight to the Holy of Holies. And when he went with his own blood, the veil tore. There's no need for all that anymore. He went with his own blood. Okay? And when we think about it, when we think, you know, back then they did the lamb did the lamb do any sin when they were committing the offering? The lamb did no sin. It was a person who was doing the offering that committed the sin and slaughtered the lamb the same way. Jesus knew no sin and did no sin, and he, the lamb, was slaughtered for us. Okay? So how can we halfway come to worship? How can we be so distracted in our worship when Jesus gave it all? then we should have some expectations of ourselves, right? Moving, we'll keep moving. Jesus cleansed the temple two times in his ministry, in the beginning of his ministry, right after he turned the water into wine at the wedding, and then right before his crucifixion. And I wondered, why didn't anybody arrest him then? The first time when he went and cleared the temple, nobody got him, because it wasn't his time. And God had in, God had a purpose of why he did that, right? And then the second time also, he went and did it. And because Jesus said, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. I hope I'm not being too hard because I told you this is something the Lord has spoke to me. And I'm not accusing anybody or saying anything because our church is a very good church and Steffi did an amazing job of talking about how important it is to have Jesus as, as part of center of our life and that we worship him. 
um, but just reminding us of, of how we should worship him, especially on this 21 day. Jesus was expressing when he cleared the temple two times the great truth, we must have reverence for God's house. Jesus taught that the temple's house is a house of prayer and absolutely nothing else should happen in the house of the Lord. Many times we hear people approach Jesus as my buddy. He's my buddy, the man upstairs, um, the man in the sky, all kinds of irreverent way of uh, addressing God. And we need to understand who our God is, that he's a holy God. He's a creator from, from the beginning of time. He started the time till before, even after we go, he's still God. Right? And how did Lord set it, Jesus set an example for us and how do we approach God? He said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. He taught us how we should approach the Holy God. Jesus himself prayed, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Our sanctuaries today are different from the time of old because since Jesus' resurrection, who wears the sanctuary now? We're the sanctuary. We're the temple of the living God, right? And we're the body of Christ as a church, and Jesus is the head, and Holy Spirit dwells within us, and we are his sanctuary. Therefore, we have to be reverent with what we do with this temple of the living God. We have to be holy in how we live, behave, talk, think, everything and we need to reevaluate daily and always, are we irreverent to this temple where the Holy Spirit abides? But may, I don't want to just say, okay, be reverent in how we behave here, but also we have to be irreverent when we come to places of worship. Um, so I looked up this crazy thing. Um, so how to go to the White House. Okay, so I looked up. Okay, how, how, if I wanted to go visit the White House, what is it that I needed to do? It's pretty intense. I can't even visit the president. What I'm getting ready to discuss is just to do a self-guided tour is the guidelines. Just for a self, I'm not even meeting the president, mind you. I have, to, I have to get a representative of the Congress to give me permission to get a self-guided tour of the White House. But before the self-guided tour, they have some stipulations. I'm going to use that as our guide. Next slide. So before it says, and I copied this from the White House, so before we go take a tour of the White House, we have to do the following, okay? We have to have identification, okay? You can't just go like, I am Phoebe and just get in there. No, I have to have a legal identification. We have to have an identification. Who are we? We're sealed by the Holy Spirit. Before we approach, we have to confess our sins, apply the blood of Jesus, and sanctify ourselves before we approach the Holy God. This is just for a tour. And we're talking about the creator of heaven and earth and how we approach him, right? There needs to be a preparation before we approach God, preparation in ourselves too, always. There's a dress code, but it's based on the event, right? There is a dress code. When attending a church service, know where we're going. How many of you wear a formal attire to a football game? Unless you're the homecoming queen or king, you're not going to be wearing a formal gown and high heels to a football game, right? You get the drift. So there is a dress code based on where and what you're attending. Use godly wisdom in the manner. Next one, it says, tours are self-guided and last approximately 45 minutes. And it says, arrive 15 minutes before schedule. 15 minutes before. (laughs) Um, I don't know about you, but I've been late to service. I've been late to my personal time prayer and late to church services, okay? So I'm guilty as charged, okay? And guess what? I'll miss the tour. If I went, if I go the way I'm going... I'm going to miss the tour. I traveled all the way to D.C., and I'm going to miss this darn tour, okay? Let's pay attention. I have found that if I don't set a time for my prayer, I will miss it that day. So if I don't say every day I'm going to get up at 5, and from 5 in the morning 
to whatever time frame, if it's an hour, hour and a half time in prayer, before we go to work, you are then accountable when you miss that time. But if you're like, oh, I'll pray when I get home from school or after work or whenever and just random about your prayer times, then it's hard to keep up. I say, this is just my personal suggestion, nothing in the word of God about it. Set a time, okay? What is your personal prayer time? Is it in the afternoon when you come from school or work? Or is it in the morning before you go start the day? Set a perfect Set a time, an accountability to yourself so that you don't miss the time and be late for the tour. Okay, so we'll keep going. We're almost coming to a conclusion here. Okay, eat a snack and stay hydrated prior to arrival. Okay? Church is not a place where we need to be eating our donuts. Okay? If we're, if you know you're coming to church, get, how long does it take to eat? down a donut, not that long, right? I don't know about you, but I can go that fast, right? Eat before you come. Eat before you come, okay? This is not the time to bring your food in unless you are, I don't know, four or five or under, whatever that time age where they don't have that ability, they can have snacks. If you're above that childhood age, come prepared, Okay, eat, drink. You can't go to the White House. You're not going to get anything to eat or drink there. Okay, you better be hydrated. So that is also for personal prayer time. Because remember, we're the sanctuary of God. So when you go for your personal prayer time, it's not the time to take your sandwich with you and your Bible and go sit for prayer. No. You want to eat? Eat first. Then go sit for prayer or eat after. But not during the prayer time. Okay, unless you're doing a long 24-hour prayer time, then I get that. Okay. All right. The next one, what does it say? Please silence your cell phone and refrain from phone calls during the tour. This is a self-guided tour, by the way. <laughs> You're not meeting the president. This is just a self-guided tour. President isn't even there, and we can't even have our cell phones. Okay? Then we should not be having our cell phones distracting us during church service or your personal time of prayer. Put it aside. Unless, I get it, if you're in church, you have somebody who's sick at home and you left them alone and you need to look at your phone to make sure they're not calling you for an emergency or you're on call for work and you're coming to church and you know they're going to call you for work or something unusual like that, okay? But to text if the sound is going up or down or rate or we need to do this or that or somebody's scarf is down or up, we don't need to do all that during service, right? Not only that, carrying side conversation in your prayer or during church service is very distracting personally and for others around you. So let's be mindful. The last one, no flash photography or video recording is permitted during your tour. What does that mean? What am I going to come up with that? <laughs> what I'm saying is be focused. Don't be distracting others. Okay? Okay. Just be focused in worship. Don't distract others with all our extra stuff that we may have. All right, in conclusion, the New Testament, we are the sanctuary of God, right? God dwells within us, the Holy Spirit. So know who we are and who we're approaching. We're approaching an almighty, omnipotent, omniscient God. So be submissive before his presence. And I end with, with this last verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 to 20. Do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Thank you so much for your, this time. May God bless us all.